Well, that was a fantastic introduction. That was unexpected. We saw them on, uh, I guess, America's Got Talent last year, so it was great to see the uh, choir up there today. Um, first, I want to start with a quick thank you to the health team for putting on a really a content-rich and star-studded um, kind of cast of characters over the course of three days here. Uh, I think it really drives a lot of value for our industry. And while Tom Petty, the late, great Tom Petty, did not write that song for these two gentlemen, um, he clearly could have, because I don't think there's a single person uh, in this room that could really put themselves in the shoes of either Mark or Stefan over the past two years. And when Jody reached out to me to ask if I was willing to uh, moderate a panel for this year's conference, I said, yes, but I have an idea. There are two folks on this planet that I'd really like to speak with uh, in an open forum. And it was these two gentlemen. And you, know, you guys have always both been incredibly gracious to me as we've you know, reached out and we've talked many, many times over the years, including the early days uh, back, in, uh, back in Cambridge as both companies were getting started. Um, but it, it, really meant, it really meant a lot to me and I think it's a great opportunity for us to hear two very different stories. Um, Moderna's story and Stefan's story is one that's very much, that very much was in the public's eye. Mark's story and Thermo's story, on the other hand, was very much one that was behind the scenes, but both of these companies have really played a critical role uh, uh, in, in tackling this pandemic over the past couple of years. And I tried out a different title, but both their teams rejected it. I was hoping to call this the Paul McCartney and the George Harrison discussion on COVID, but it didn't exactly go that way. But I think in many ways, um, you know, those are, those are the personas that, uh, that are represented by these two companies. Before we kick off the, uh, the, the start of the discussion, um, I'm going to ask everyone in the room just to stand up for a moment. You two can sit down. So I'm going to ask everyone to get up. And I can see some of you, so I'll make sure that you're, all, that you're all standing. I just really want to take a moment to applaud you for the work that you've both done and your companies have done over the past couple of years. Thank you. It's, um, I, 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 hope that we, uh, I hope that we never need your services to this extent again <laughs> in the future. Uh, we had a conversation about vacation time in, in the, in the, uh, back in the green room, and it was a very short-lived conversation. I know there wasn't much of that over the past couple of years. Well, let's kick it off. Um, let's go back in time, and let's go back to the year 10 BC, which is 10 years before COVID. And so this is 2009, and let's spend a minute talking about, a few minutes talking about company building. And Mark, I want to start with you. Um, you took over the role of CEO at Thermo Fisher in 2009. I'd like you to walk us through maybe where the life science industry was at that point. And as you stepped in, as you took the helm of Thermo Fisher, you know, what did you think, what were the missing pieces at that time? You already had a sizable company. This was not a startup company. This, is, this was a company that was pieced together over decades. That it, uh, I'm guessing it had a 20, 25, 30 billion dollar market cap at the time, maybe a bit more, a bit less. But what were the critical pieces that you saw in front of you in order to build a company that has really become the leading supplier for therapeutic developers, for diagnostic developers, for medical devices, for all kinds of research institutes, not just in the, in the United States, but all, the, all around the world. Sorry. Yeah, so Mike, thank you for uh, the invitation. Great to be here. You know, when I think back uh, 2009, um, coming out of the financial crisis, right? And, you know, you saw an environment where, um, you know, still stresses in the economy, determining what funding would be like in science. And, you know, biotech was on a good spot, but, you know, academic budgets were still stressed from, the, from that period of time. And one of the things that we thought about back then was where could a company, you know, really make a difference with an intense customer focus? Just, you know, think about how do you enable customer success and what would be the missing components? And over time, we built out the company by adding, you know, life science reagents and building out our um, capabilities there. And then ultimately, expanded our instruments business to include electron microscopy and, and a very substantial addition of pharmaceutical development uh, and manufacturing services, which we added um, back in the 2017 timeframe. So really a view of how do you support the academic research, the biotech and pharmaceutical customer base with the things that they would need to enable the scientific revolution that we've been living in right now. 
Where were the biggest gaps at the time? As you, as you, was it just the, the, the lack of involvement in pharma R&D? But you were already touching many areas in, sure. that, in that realm, correct? Yeah, you know, for us, I think we wanted to be in every laboratory every day and have the most essential um, you know, technologies that would make a difference. And to use that to foster relationships that we would be able to build on over time. And I can think about some of the early discussions when Moderna was starting out and, um, and really understanding the needs and, and making sure we had the technologies to be able to enable um, our customer success. So that's really where we thought about it. And ultimately, I'm very glad that we were able to add the biotech and pharmaceutical development and manufacturing services because they got used quite heavily to support yeah. uh, the COVID response around the world. Was sequencing, next-gen sequencing, uh, was it a distraction for the company? Was it an important piece for the company? Uh, obviously, it plays a key role in, in a lot of our research and clinical sure. initiatives now in oncology and across many diseases. But you know, that's not your business today, is it? And, and you've, you've, you've gone everywhere else but next-gen sequencing. Yeah. I know you moved into it for a bit, but it's, I think you've built a remarkable company without moving specifically into the space. Yeah, so you know, from a sequencing standpoint, you know, we would still be the number two player behind Illumina. We have okay. about, a, about a half a billion dollars of revenue, but really focused on one thing, which is helping an oncologist guide therapy selection. Okay. And it's made a real difference for patients. And that's where we played, but in the traditional research side, much less so. Sounds great. Stefan, let's turn to a little company called Moderna. Um, Stefan, I think you took over in March of 2011. Um, and um, just, uh, uh, just a side note, I, I joined a company next door, Foundation Medicine, in April 2011. And shortly after that, one day, Stefan came knocking on our door and he was interested in, A, just saying hello, uh, but also wanted to know when we would have some additional space available <laughs> <laughs> in, in the event that we were ever thinking uh, about moving. Um, but Stefan, your story, I think, even in the early days, might be a bit different than most of us would expect today, because Moderna was always a big vision. It was a big idea from the beginning. And so I would ask for a show of hands, but I can't see anyone's hand, so I won't go there. But you know, the question is, did Moderna start with an initial funding of $200 million? No. An initial funding of $100 million, perhaps? The answer is no. 50 million, 20 million, no. Your initial funding, as you told me, Few, a week and a half ago was $2 million. And then you had a critical pharma deal for several hundred million dollars not too many months later. Take us back to the beginning. Today, that same idea could raise $250 million out of the gates from VCs. Why did you choose that path? Well, when we started, everybody, including myself, when I first heard about the idea of using messenger RNA to make protein in people seemed crazy. Right. When Nubar Feyan from Flagship called me and I went to his office and he showed me the data that I'm coming from Harvard, my first reaction was, this is impossible. And everybody else said the same thing for many years after that. And the reason I decided to do it is after thinking about it for a few weeks and talking with a few people who understand biology way better than I do, is that it could be possible. And the thing that really got me very excited is that if we could safely inject in humans mRNA to make what you code in a message, your head could not comprehend what this was going to do for humankind in the next 20 to 50 years. Just look at how recombinant technology, started by Genentech and Amgen back in the 70s, has changed medicine. I think if you could go into a time machine and tell the founding team of Genentech when there were 20 people and a dog in California that one day there will be an amazing drug like let's say Ketudra, an antibody to PD-1. They would have said, what are you talking about, Mike? They didn't know what PD-1 was and they didn't know they could make an antibody. They were struggling to make a human protein. Mm -hmm. And so we had a bit of the same mindset as with Moderna who say, look, if you can move from analog medicine to digital medicine when we use a piece of code, Mm -hmm. to get in your body, it's either going to be a total disaster and a failure, or it's going to be the biggest platform company has ever existed in life science. And so we said we'd rather take a 5% chance to change medicine there forever than a 90% chance to build the average biotech company of one drug, who, by the way, most probably is going to fail. 
And so we, we just took that approach. We started with $2 million because we said, let's explore the biology you know, in animals and preclinical. You don't need a lot of money for doing that. Um, and as we got more data, we raised a bit more money, and then we got the big deal with AstraZeneca, yeah. which really was transformational. Why were you able to get that so early? You, you, you weren't well funded. Flagship wrote the entire $2 million initially. Was it all flagship for the first $2 million? It was flagship, and I wrote a little bit. Okay, okay, very good. <laughs> it was so, the best investment of my life. So, I think four cents a share. <laughs> there are a lot of young CEOs who will say, we can't do a deal unless we're better funded. We can't do this. We can't do that without more money on the balance sheet. That didn't stop you. Yeah, and again, 10 years ago, I mean, as you know, biotech was quite different, the type of checks that are being written now. Right. And I hope Moderna helped a little bit the industry to show that investing in biotech is a good idea. Um, is, is, we said we cannot pick one drug and pray every day that we pick the right drug because there was massive technology unknowns. It is usual, you know, unknown, unknown on the technology front of mRNA because nobody had put a mRNA drug in a clinic. And at the same time, there's always a biology risk, which is the pathway, the, the disease you are going after. And so we said, if we think this is going to be a platform that's going to revolutionize medicine, picking one drug and praying is most probably a bad strategy. Mm -hmm. So we said, let's pick a big portfolio. We're going to try different technology at the same time. So we did vaccines, we did, you know, cancer drugs, we... We have a drug, we're gonna get the data soon, injected in people's heart after a heart attack. So this is what we're doing with AZ. Um, and we say we're gonna try a lot of technology. And then for every technology application, we're gonna try several drugs to de-risk the biology risk. Because picking only one vaccine or picking only one cancer drug is very risky. If you pick the wrong one from a biology standpoint, you might have in the clinic a false negative, mm -hmm. where the clinical trial doesn't work. Everybody believes it's the technology because it's new, but you pick the wrong scientific hypothesis on the biology. Yeah. So we build a portfolio of around 10, 15 drugs, and then it becomes this monster, which is how do you fund it? Because it's nice to say I'm gonna de-risk technology and biology with a portfolio. But then when you start adding all the costs, you say, oh, shit, I need a billion dollar. And so, um, so we basically, with the board in a very conscious way, traded technology and biology risk to reduce it with financing risk and execution risk, because we had to do all those things at the same time. And so this is why doing a deal was so fundamental, because at the time, as a preclinical company, nobody had ever raised $200 million, which today happened every day of the week. But at the time, this has never happened. And so as I looked at how do I get there, the only way I could potentially get there, maybe, was a deal. And so then the question is, how do you get somebody to give you $250 million upfront with zero clinical data? And the way we ended up doing that deal with AstraZeneca is we build incredible optionality for the buyer. We say the only way, if you're sitting in that seat, and having been at Lilly was helpful to me, because I could think about it the other way around. So the only way sitting in that seat that you give anybody a quarter billion dollar check is you need to have incredible optionality. And so we built this crazy deal where Goodwin Proctor was fantastic at writing, <laughs> because literally there was put and call options in the deal. Mm -hmm. So both in preclinical and in the clinic, if they did not like a drug, they could give it back to us for a put and they could use the slot that they bought to get another drug name from the platform. So it was a massive bet on the belief that we had the platform. And the night before we approved the deal with the board, I told the board, because we don't know what we don't know, we might be selling the company tonight through that deal. Because the only thing that might work in the next 10 to 20 years is what we're giving AstraZeneca, which was cardiology and oncology. Mm -hmm. At the time, by the way, we had no idea we could do vaccines. It turned out to be not, not bad vaccine technology. Um, and that was quite really interesting about building Moderna, which is there was so much ambiguity, so much unknown. It was always trying to build optionality and trying to always correct the path based on data. We have many times in the company history pivoted the company 90 degrees right or left based on data. We have no ego. We are so mission driven to make this thing work for patients that we were, many times we said we were wrong. You know, we could spend the next hour talking about company building and especially with these, uh, I think, two very diverse approaches here. But, uh, you know, I guess I'll summarize what, what uh, Stefan just said, and that is he had the belief, <laughs> right? You had the belief they needed a deal. They needed these options in order to move the company forward. And number three, in that deal, 
you as CEO and as your team, you knew what you wanted. So you said you had, you know, you developed the puts and calls and I'm sure all types of different strategies to get that accomplished. But I think there are some really important lessons in terms of, you know, how you build these companies to a certain point. It's never magic. There's always key strategy that goes into it. And I think what, what you see here are two very different paths. Let's turn to the COVID world. Um, you know, I, I almost don't know where to begin, um, but Mark, maybe I'll start with you. Um, again, thermo supplies, R&D and clinical companies and partners all over the world. Um, I think you're the dominant supplier. And I'm gonna just tell a quick side story. Mark COO, um, Mark Stevenson, um, is someone I've gotten to know very well over the past five years, but over the course of the past couple of years, I've been working with a group every Friday that just has a discussion about a lot of COVID activities around the United States and around the world. It's a very senior group. And about a year and a half ago, maybe you know, four or five months into the pandemic, um, we invited Mark to join that conversation on a Friday. And what he was able to discuss in terms of activity, COVID-related activity for diagnostics and therapeutic development and vaccine development all over the world, I think astonished even this group of very senior biotech leaders. And it started to give, even that group didn't appreciate, I think, how deeply involved Thermo, Thermo Fisher is, is in all these different activities. As we moved into COVID mm -hmm. and you saw what Moderna was doing, you saw what therapeutic development, uh, uh, kind of the therapeutic development that was in front of us. When did you know that something historic might be expected of you and your company? Like, was there a day that it hit you when you said, oh my God, we have to make sure we, we deliver on all this, you know, all these supply chain issues. Walk us, walk us through that, uh, you know, those, those earlier days. So Mike, early on, we were supplying sequencers to the CDC in Wuhan, and our team in China had to get special permits to be able to travel. Um, and having been in China for many, many years, this seemed very strange and very alarming. And we as a team started to say, all right, what does this mean? And what do we need to think about beyond helping the Chinese government respond to this. Is this is, January? This, of this, is, this okay. is early January. Early January. And, you know, as we started to get a sense of what was going on there, we started by working on a diagnostic and getting the sequence so that we could actually develop a qPCR test to, you know, be able to detect whether you had um, COVID. And the amazing thing is, you know, having spent my career in the diagnostics industry, you know, you think about, you know, if you do 100,000 tests that you provide over the course of a year, that's a lot of tests, right? And, you know, so, so the scale, you know, we, we started out just saying, can we do it? And we developed quite early by, by mid-February, we were able to develop a test that worked, right? And by, by mid-March, we had the various approvals to the authorizations to use the test as a, as a diagnostic around the world. The interesting thing was, um, as a management team, we, we were looking at how the pandemic was spreading and we said that this is the greatest industrialization challenge that we're ever going to face, right? It, it's, it's not, can you double your capacity or tenfold your capacity, but how many tests could be needed? Right, ultimately. And it wasn't just tests. Right, this is just one piece like, of it. Right. Yeah, this is one piece of it. And we, we wound up ultimately, we were shipping at one point, you know, 20 million tests a week. And if I look back since March of 2020, we've shipped almost three quarters of a billion tests, the kits, right? I mean, th these numbers are staggering, right? And if you think about what the manufacturing scale up was, to do that was one of the activities that we, we did. The interesting thing was, because we support so many clinical trials, it wasn't just in diagnostics, we were getting inundated with, you know, helping to actually do the clinical studies on would an existing medicine work, right? You know, to, against the, against the disease and ultimately wound up being involved in 300 different, you know, supporting clinical trial programs that ultimately winnowed down to the few that were successful. And then we scaled up manufacturing both on therapies and on vaccines. And this has been a, it's been a manufacturing challenge more than anything about how do you scale up and support 
billions of doses of vaccines in different ways and 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 the many different you know many different therapies that have gotten some approvals over the years. Did you ask the US government or any foreign governments for any financial support in order to do this? No, this is we we wound up getting contracts to do certain things but no financial support um, actually, until about a month ago, we got some support on something different, but we did this all on our own and we scaled up in a, in a very significant way. Um, we wound up where there were supply chain shortages. We actually built some factories just to support viral transport. I mean, just some different things that the country needed and, and you I remember were, when the biggest bottleneck, bottleneck was we couldn't get tips. Yes. We and, could, that was the big thing. And, everybody and, that, was and, that was actually, and that's actually crazy. where we actually got government money recently. Okay. Is that the US government recently. Is, it would have been it, nice to get Yeah, the US government asked us to build the world's largest pipette tip factory, which we're uh, building in North Carolina now. Other than that, uh, we did this on our own. We'll come back to that, especially as we look forward, uh, maybe post-pandemic. I can't quite say that, but um, uh, I think we'll get there at some point. Stefan. Um, Let's not talk about the early days of kind of the science and getting the sequence of the virus. And, and, you know, there was a point at which very early on you knew that you could build a vaccine. OK, once you knew you could build it, you then must have started to think about the ramifications of building something like this, of manufacturing something like this. Um, were you thinking about it as a U.S. problem at the time? back February, March, April of last year? Were you thinking about it as a global issue? How did you think about government involvement? Like, what were you, what were you looking at in front of you at that time? Sure, so maybe for context, when we realized this was gonna be a pandemic, which is the week of January 20th of 2020. You knew? Yeah, yep. it was gonna be a 1918 like shit show. Yep. Um, so I came back, I, was, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning sweating. And I started calling everybody, <laughs> saying it's gonna be like 1980, it just hit me. Um, and so just for context, Moderna was a company with 800 people. We had never done a phase three in our history. We never launched a product. The manufacturing facility that Mark knows well in Norwood was a development site. It was designed not to be a commercial site. And so, we had to figure out how do we do the phase one, two, three quickly without cutting any corner? How do we get money for it? Because the cost of the clinical studies only was gonna be bigger than the cash we had in the company. So even if I stopped to do everything else, I was gonna go take the company under uh, just developing the vaccine before getting it to authorization. And then the piece that took a lot of energy and time was manufacturing. As Mark said, what most of the world has spent no time talking about last year yeah. was manufacturing. Were the two of you speaking last year? Yeah, we were speaking, when, help us speaking and meeting yeah. and working together. We have many pieces of the Moderna vaccine that some of you got in a room that we couldn't have made without Marx and his team help. Um, but the piece that was crazy is on January 27, I come back from Davos. I, I sit down with Juan who runs manufacturing and thank the Lord he used to run manufacturing for Novartis before. All of manufacturing for Novartis, so 100 plus factories working for him. And that was the blessing we had at Moderna. And so I say, sit down. I walk in his office and I'm like, sit down. <laughs> He's like, oh shit, what's going on? And I'm like, I need you to make a billion dollars next year. So for context, just two numbers. One, in 2019, for the entire year, for the whole company, we made less than 100,000 doses. 100,000 doses, a billion. So he told me, and he, you can see he's doing the math in his head. So you need 10 times, 10,000 times more product. I'm like, yes. And he's like, it's impossible. I said, don't waste time trying to tell me it's impossible. And how many flu vaccines were produced? That was the that number, that. Okay. second number I was gonna go to okay. is the entire flu market across five companies, including the GSK and the Sanofi, all those big guys, the entire market worldwide, 500 million doses. So you can imagine Juan's head is like, he wants me to make 10,000 10, times more product than we made last year. And he wants me to make twice as much as the entire industry makes of flu shot every year. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, are you crazy? I'm like, no, it's gonna be a shit show. Start to think about how you're gonna make it happen. So Mark and his team were super helpful. Lonza was super helpful. And from the beginning I was, obsessed about global 
because as you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm French, I'm not American. And what shocked me is in March, February, within Europe, which is a, f a free trading zone like the US, countries were forbidding masks and ventilators to be shipped from Germany to Italy, where the law is you can move anything you want when you want. Like here, you know, you put it on your truck and you just, and you just drive. Well, they, they, put, they put back a restriction of, of movement of goods in Europe, which I never thought would be possible in my lifetime. I'm like, shit, what are they going to do in six or nine months with vaccines? And so we built a plant outside the US and we picked Switzerland, not by accident. Because I'm like, if we're going to make half a billion doses in Switzerland, there's 10 million people. There is no way we're going to hoard the doses because they don't have enough people. So I was very worried that the US would not let us export. Uh, and then by picking another country, a bigger country, I was worried that that country will do the same. And so we picked Switzerland by design because there's very high manufacturing capabilities in pharmaceuticals and it's less than 10 million people. So um, somehow we are out of time and that's impossible, but I'm gonna steal some more time and I'll apologize later because uh, I do wanna ask you a few more questions because I still, like, I still feel like we're in the middle of all this and I wanna take a few moments to at least look ahead from here. Um, yes, COVID has been a scientific challenge, technical challenge to some extent, but I think many of the scientific challenges, we're still working on therapeutics, many of the scientific challenges, the technical challenges, if they're not behind us, like we're, we have our arms around them. Mm -hmm. This does feel like a logistics challenge going forward. It's a, it's a supply chain challenge. Um, I read something, it was either the New York Times this morning or Wall Street Journal this morning saying um, there's a concern that we'll be less prepared the next time around than even this last time. I actually find that hard to believe um, and, and I can get very pessimistic on some of these things. How do you view the world supply chain as it relates to all the things that we still have to accomplish you know, this year, next year, but also in the future? Do you see... Um, do you see a, a, you know, a, a world where we find a way to actually work together and straighten some of these things out? It has to happen at some level. You're a global company. You told me before that you're not buying airplanes like Amazon is to, right. to ship your things around the world. Mark, where does this go from here? Yeah, you know, from my perspective, you know, in, in our industry about supporting pharmaceutical biotech and the technologies that we make, um, things are slowly returning to normal, right? We, th there's been a huge amount of capacity added. It's still strained, but it feels like, you know, in the next six months, things will be back to normal, even with the heightened demand that we're, we're supporting and the industry is supporting. So, so from that perspective, I think things are in a better spot. There's clearly a lot more regionalization than existed before. Many things were single plant shipped to the world. And now what you're seeing is you know, a European facility, a domestic facility. Along with stockpiling, correct? And you see some of that as well, depending yeah. on how long something will last. So, so, you know, that's being sorted out, you know, but I would say that I'm optimistic that that one gets sorted out. I think, you know, on the pandemic um, side of things and preparedness, I actually think some of the, the better discussions I've had with different governments around the world is to think of the next pandemic like you would think about defense spending that you actually have to make some investments that you hope never get used, that it's okay if things get discarded because you stockpiled or you build facilities or whatever the technologies are, but you're prepared for different scenarios. And I think that it's a small amount of money to spend, but it would make a huge difference from a societal standpoint. But I sense optimism in your words and yeah. in your tone. I so agree. that's helpful. Stefan, just let, close us out on where are we heading with vaccines? Bundled vaccines, what's coming next? What, what should we expect? Sure, so first I think one story that is not enough told in the media is we're gonna soon be swimming in vaccine around the world. A bit like happened in the US. If you remember last January, you have to line in the street and to be a certain age right. group to get the vaccine. By May, you could walk in any CVS and get a vaccine the same day. Uh, the same thing is gonna happen around the world very soon. And I, my guess is two to three months. Uh, 3.7 billion adults have been vaccinated around the world. Uh, the industry in the last 30 days has shipped 1.3 billion doses in the last month. And so if you look at these 5 billion adults on the planet, 
So if you look at the map, a couple of months of more supply of vaccines will provide a vaccine to anybody who wants one. I mean, two doses of vaccines. Uh, the biggest thing I worry about is logistics in terms of vaccination of people in low-income countries. And even if you look at the numbers today, the number of vaccines per day is starting to go down. It's around 26 million per day, which is a crazy number around the planet. But it's starting for the last few weeks to go down. And not because there's not enough vaccines. It's because we're starting to get more and more vaccine hesitancy and access issue in low-income country, where I know a lot of people are working hard towards. But I think soon we're swimming on vaccine. The question is, how many can we get in arms? And then if I look more forward, uh, you know, we believe that we can get a multi-respiratory vaccine in a single dose. So you get your flu boost yep. and your COVID boost and your RSV boost and your HMPV boost. There's around 12 viruses that hurts humans from a respiratory standpoint. Our goal as a company is to stop people going to hospital because they get a viral infection. And so we're going to develop that in the next couple of years, not the next 20 years, the next couple of years. We already have a flu plus COVID booster single dose uh, in development. When and will that be on the market? When will that be available? The, the fastest time to market will be 23. Fall of 23, we'll assume best case scenario okay. like we did last year, but I will not bet against the team. Um, and the other piece is against pandemic readiness. I think we could go faster next time. I think we could go, assuming same, you know, December, January virus emerging. I think a July, August vaccine authorization is not crazy in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and unlike this time where when the vaccine got authorized, we shipped 20 million doses to the CDC because we only had 20 million doses that we've made over the previous six months. But if you think about where we are now capacity-wise and where we're going, because we, we keep expanding, and Mark and his team are helping us. Uh, actually, I have in my inbox something to send you for approval or more filling capacity. Um, but I think we should be in a position uh, next year to ship in those same six months to do the clinical studies, to be making at risk a billion doses. So think about how the world would have been different. If in July of 2020, we could have had a vaccine authorized, and the same day, we could have shipped a billion doses through the door. And this is where I think we're going, and we will have soon this next summer. Well, as I mentioned to Jody and the health team, we needed three hours, not 30 minutes. So uh, listen, I, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll finish where I started, and that is with a big thanks to both of you, not just for coming today, but just for uh, the tremendous amount of work that you and your teams have kind of put forth over the past couple of years. We truly, we say it all the time, we don't know where we'd be without you. We truly don't know where we would be without both of your organizations and both of you today. So thanks. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.